Okay. We're going to look at the first commandment of the Chag Hamatzot. Do you have this online so we can see it? Yeah, it's in the, yes. It is. It was sent out in the uh, bulletin. It was sent out in the, um, in the bulletin that was sent on Wednesday. My emails are all screwed up. Can I do the bulletin from the internet? I don't know my emails. Are... Because it's still Shabbat here, I can't do the forward thing, but it should be okay. present there on the, yeah. So it's somewhere in, um, in, in the bulletin. Rabbi Cantor? Yes. If you wouldn't object, I can go to it, take a screenshot, and then put it up as my virtual background. Uh, instead, actually, since it's already past Shabbat there, I don't mind if you wanted to share a link to it in the chat because you're already. Oh, right. Because um, I think yeah. the name is Jason. Jason, I'm in Maryland, so it's long past sundown here. I will do that. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay. Thank you, Tybal. Okay, great. So uh, we're going to study beginning with this verse in Exodus, in the book of Exodus. And it's the first time that we come across this commandment that we're supposed to celebrate some sort of a chag. I'm sorry, Rabbi, just to tell you, there's oh, yeah. no chat. There's no chat. Oh, it's not no chat that right now, right? It was, it was no disabled. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I'm sorry that it will have to just be one of those things where we're, where um, we set it up. I promise to be very verbal about uh, if, if I ever if I ever get through my first text, we'll get there. <laughs> but we're we're trying, we're trying, we're trying. No, you, I appreciate all of you. Um, we're we will we'll get through all of this together. Okay, the feast of unleavened bread, the Chag Hamatzot. So you have a Chag, and a Chag. We have a, a a noun describing another noun, also known as Snichut. So we have a Chag a Hamatzot. It is the festival of the Matzot. We already know about matzot. Why? Because we were, it was described that when we were leaving Egypt in the original story, that there was a, a series of flattened breads because we didn't have the time when we were leaving Egypt in order to actually have the dough rise. Therefore, we actually have these matzot. So when we're commanded to have a festival of the flattened breads, it should sound familiar in terms of a commanded uh, holiday. And uh, we are supposed to tishmor it. What do we know about the idea of shmira, of shmor? What else are we commanded to shmor? Et Shabbat. That's the most familiar one, right? Shmor vezachor. At the very least, that might be familiar to you because the poet in, 60, in 16th century Lurianic Kabbalah wrote it into our poem, Lechadodi. Shamor v'zachor b'dibor echad. And so it might be very familiar to you as shamor as a command. We should guard Shabbat or shomer Yisrael from, uh, from the Psalms and also from our poetic pieces of Tachanun. God is the guardian of Israel. Okay, so shomer is also a guardian. You might know it from the, from the universe of, uh, of guarding over those who are deceased. Uh, because there's this idea of shmirah, also of guardianship over human beings. Okay, but we're supposed to we're supposed to guard. We're supposed to keep over guard. We are supposed to shmor, do this observance in some way. We we translate it as observance. But we have to be careful of what that meant because shmor and also zahor and also keeping meets vote. All of these things could theoretically fall under the giant category of observance. So I want to make sure we're being really careful with that verb. And this is the only verse we're looking at. So I have the, the leisure of picking it apart. Ah, and there's also Leil Shimorim, as Alan points out. And what is Leil Shimorim? The night of watching and guarding. And what were we, what was being watched and guarded? Right, so we knew there was going to be presumably a final one of these makot, of these uh, plagues that was going to pass upon the people. And we were looking out to see what was going to happen in Goshen, in the land of the, where the Jews were residing, where the Israelites were residing. And so the Leil Shimorim refers to this idea of a nighttime when as uh, as we think of it majestically, the dogs didn't bark, right? It, it's this idea of an utter silence in which God passed over the homes that were marked with the blood of what? Right, of the of the sacrifice, exactly. So, um, so let's finish reading through this verse. I, I could pick apart verses all day long. I could take the entire hour picking apart this verse. Et chag hamatzot tishmor. 
Shivat Yamim. It's unclear to me whether Shivat Yamim is belongs to the first part of this verse or the second. You'll see why in, the, in a second. Okay. Et Chag Hamatzot Tishmor. That could be a phrase. Or Et Chag Hamatzot Tishmor Shivat Yamim. You should guard for seven days. What? What? What's the one thing that's clear, Larry? Seven days. Oh, thank you, Larry. Yes, it's very clear that it's seven days. It's not a two-day Yom Tov. Thank you very much. It's very clear here there, that we're not talking about two days of Yom Tov at the beginning and two days at the end, which is what is observed nowadays as a, what's the opposite of a leniency? A stringency. Yeah, I, I could only think of the word in Hebrew. Sorry, that happens to me lately. Um, a humra, a leniency. Unfortunately, this idea uh, has emerged in such a way that it's become more burdensome than joyful to many people um fortunate to larry in particular fortunately given that 75 years ago there was a reinstatement of the notion of statehood and uh much broad much more broadly residency in uh and the the possibility of jewish ownership of land in the land of israel since then, it has been possible for people both inside the land of Israel, meaning the what is considered Eretz Yisrael biblically, and also people who live outside of it but own land inside the land of Israel, to claim this kind of biblical observance. So both the, for those who are currently living in Israel and even for those who own land in Israel or own a place in Israel even, they would say that they can observe the way that we go back to this biblical observance. Okay? We're almost done picking this apart. We observe it for seven days. Tochel matzot. So it might be seven days you're supposed to, it might be et chag hamatzot tishmor. You should guard the chag hamatzot, the holiday of matzahs. Shiva jamim tochel matzot. Seven days you should eat matzot. That we do. We don't, we have, <laughs> we get that one down, right? We had three plates of matzot here. Um, I'm sure uh, we could go into great detail on what matzot were for them. Hurried cakes. They were probably soft that's for another discussion right they're probably not crunchy oh both larry and Eric and alan want to say something about this yes yes alan just briefly uh, and this has always puzzled me because there's so many places in the in the bible in, in, in the torah where it says seven days you should eat matzah yet the halakha is you're only required to eat matzah on day one and day two so i never understood that so alan wants to know why it says so many places in the torah that you should eat matzah, to, tochal matzot shivat yamim, sh, sh, shivat yamim, that you're supposed to be tochal matzot, you're supposed to eat it, but then the halakha turns out to be for two days only that we are required to eat matzot as the, as the, um, as the kind of uh, baseline tier. That is for another shiur, but I do, have, <laughs> but I do have an answer for you. I do have an answer for you. And I think that it has to do with the, um, with the, onus of of uh of having to have um what it takes to actually make kosher matzot so i okay. just one, one more tidbit because there are articles in here that talk about that passover is really a combination of chag hamatzot which was for seven days mm -hmm. and chag hapesach for one day mm -hmm. so mahu detema one would think that if you're going to have a holiday chag hamatzot for seven days that you would otherwise be required to eat matzot for seven days so if it's I'm a sure there's a reason why we don't you would think if you're combining these two holidays, this Chag Hamatzot and Chag HaPesach, that perhaps one would be actually required to eat it for the seven days. But we sincerely wind up with Halakha across the board that only requires us for two days. Now we're going to talk about combining with a completely different festival in this verse. So look here in the midway through the verse. So this is Shivat Yamim Tochal Matzot Asher Tziviticha Lemoed Chodesh Ha'aviv, Ki Chodesh Ha'aviv, Yatsata Mi Mitzrayim. So this becomes, this is how I've commanded you at the time of the month of Aviv. And what is this month of Aviv? Right. right, Aviv we know as a springtime month, because in the month of Aviv, Yatsata Mi Mitzrayim. What do we understand rabbinically to be the month of Aviv? We understand it to be Nisan. We understand for, ultimately we understand that the beginning of the month of Aviv is the beginning of the new year. But the point here is that it is calendrically remembered 
And we do this at the same time on the calendar as when we went out from Mitzrayim, when we went out from Egypt. Now, this commandment that's present in, uh, we're not gonna talk about the context so that we can have a fun reveal at the end, but this particular command comes to tell us that we're supposed to observe Chag Hamatzot, so this feast of matzah, it tells us we're supposed to eat matzah. We're supposed to observe the holiday for seven days and that we're supposed to do it at the appointed time of the month of Aviv because that's when we went out from Egypt. Are we all on the same page about that? We get that? Fantastic. We're gonna study just a little bit of Pesachim, which is the tractate of both Mishnah and then this is the Bavli, this is the Babylonian uh, Talmud the tractate that emerges from that Mishnaic conversation. I'd like to remind people when this emerges, the Mishnah is codified as an oral conversation in the year roughly 200 common era. The Talmudic conversation that we're about to read is codified as an oral conversation in about the year 600 CE. Hey, okay. everybody on the same page? Great. So this is the 118th daf page from that Talmud. And it's a conversation that starts with Rav Sheshet quoting from one of the rabbis who is mentioned at least twice in most Haggadot. Okay, Rabbi Elazar ben Azaria. He's the one who miraculously, we were talking about this at our Seder table. Ella, remember we were saying his hair turned white because he's ke shivim, right? He was like 70 years old. He had this miraculous occurrence and he, he thought he wouldn't be taken seriously. So he's Elazar ben Azaria. He was appointed head, he was appointed Rosh Yeshiva, but he had this miraculous occurrence that he was made to look like he was old enough to run the Yeshiva because he was very nervous about uh, being able to be um, uh, believed and trusted as a sage in his own time. So Rav Sheshit is coming here uh, to, um, uh, to quote Elazar ben Azaria, who himself is transmitting a statement from the Amoraim, who were much earlier sages. And he's saying the following. He says, Anybody who is disparaging, so to speak, towards the festivals, towards the Chagim, it's as though they are doing Avodah Zara. That's a pretty intense uh, statement, yeah? What's Avodah Zarah? Idol, idol worship. And <laughs> Avodah Zarah probably actually means idol worship to those in the Mishnaic and Talmudic conversation. Taibel, you had a thought? No, actually a question. I yeah. wondered by context, is this only the three pilgrimage or are disparaging other holidays also up there? In this particular like if you case, disparage I you're talking before. about the three Moadim. Yeah, I think you're right. So, but then you, one could, in theory, disparage Yom Kippur, which is the Shabbat of all Shabbatot, and it's not the same problem. I think in this particular case, we're just talking about the Moed holidays. I think we're talking about the, the pilgrimage festival. So you're right that there's a more expansive conversation to be had about the others, but there's a reason why they're mentioning this particular type of holiday. So he's saying all those who would... Who would dilute disparage who would put down the festival holidays it's like they're idol worshiping and he's going to bring a an example of a juxtaposition of verses as they're given okay so he's going to go back and he's going to cite this verse that i brought to you he's going to say go to the second verse first but uh batre that the um batre means like second Okay, see the very last line in the Hebrew? It says, et chag hamatzot tishmor. That's our verse that I just cited. You see the last words in the Hebrew? Et chag hamatzot tishmor. The festival of matzah you should keep. If you look up slightly, it says, Elohei masecha lo ta'aselach. And you shall not make Elohei masecha. Those are uh, golden calves, right? Um, uh, you shouldn't make for yourselves molten idols. What is the proof text that he's going to? He's saying, well, verse 18 in the Torah that, uh, that we quoted here is, 
את חג המצות תשמור שבעת ימים תאכל מצות אשר ציוויתיך למועד חודש האביב כי בחודש האביב יצאת ממצרים but if you back up one verse the verse stands alone אלוהי מסכה לא תעשה לך you shall not make for yourself molten gods and it's it is odd it stands out in this whole section because the, the question is why why would those two things they're answering a question that we didn't ask here in this conversation which is why would molten gods golden calves so to speak be mentioned in the same breath in the next verse over from this verse about Chag Hamatzot furthermore what does it mean to disparage the holiday? For that, we're going to go to a different commentator. So let's move to the next page, and we're going to look at Shari Chuba, which is a much, much, much later commentary. And in order to get through it, we're going to mostly read the commentary in the English. So it's it's going to jump in right at the inyan uh, of of this this uh, fellow, this person. Who is um, who is mevaze uh, et uh, ha'meodot? Okay, moadot. Sorry, et et ha'meodot. So it's the person who is disparaging the holidays. She ose malacha that he does malacha. He does work on the intermediate days of the festival, and doesn't worry. Spurns the punishment. Because the prohibition of work on the intermediate days of the festival is not meforash Torah. It's not explicit in the Torah. Let me stop there for a second. What does that mean? What does that mean? What does that mean? What is Shari Chuba saying? That what does it mean to disparage the festivals? It means to work on Cholam Oed. To do malacha, not to work as in like you're going to work. I want to be very clear here. They're not saying go to work. They're not saying people who go to their jobs are the worst and they're idol worshippers. That's not what he's saying. He's saying to do malacha, as in to do what is prohibited on Yom Tov, on the, the days of Cholam Oed, that is what makes you, Ki'ilu, you are doing avodah zarah. But how would you drive to your job without doing malacha? Mm, this is like I want to get some. I want to get some organized thoughts from people. So raise some hands and let me take some thoughts. Joey, yes. Okay, so Joey, Joey asks it this way: Where would you draw the line on that? Right. So is the line that if you do anything that would be uh, otherwise prohibited on a yom tov, and you do it on Chol Moed, that makes you into one of these folks who is a transgressor on a uh, or a disparager on a, a whole moed or not what what does that do remember there's more of this text to study as well we're going to get further into it right and you're going to read ahead if you need to okay um so where's the line is that it or is there a differentiator is there a differential between yom tov and whole moed and the malacha or the other things that we might do okay who else? I'll get you in a second time. I want to see if there's anyone else we haven't heard from. Anyone else have a, a comment or a question? So certain things are very explicitly laid out as malacha. There are 39 labors and subcategories from those labors that are laid out as to what is malacha. So it does seem like it's pretty clear, you know, what the line might be for this particular commentator as to what happens during Cholam Oed. Okay, yeah. That's right. Right, so if it is indeed Chol Hamoed, why aren't you free? Like, give me the reason. I understand it's not explicitly stated in the Torah, but why wouldn't we be free? You would ask, right, to do what it is that we would otherwise do on other days. It, sure, it's the festival, but it's not the days of Yom Tov that are taking place, right? Okay. Right. 
Okay, so Sandra's saying that, that she's guessing the point of this is, is that you shouldn't forget that it's still Pesach, or if you don't mind my uh, amending to your, uh, your, your comment, saying um, that it's, it's Chag, it's still Chag Matzot, right? According to, if we're looking at all the different ways that this is Chag, one might forget that it's still Chag Matzot if one treats those days differently, okay? Um, okay, let's read a little more in here. Tybal, let me let you either comment or ask, and then I'll go back to the. Um, just fast, because what it seemed to me first that it says this this commentate the idea was to make only two different one differentiation. It's either a chag or it's the weekday, and it's doing away with the in, doing away with the interim status. I mean, granted, those days we don't have all the extra services and all those things, but. For some reason, whoever it was didn't like two segments, two, three categories with a segmentation between the, the three. Right. So this this person's very uncomfortable with this idea of having this in between category, this Benoni category, a third segmentation of this idea of uh, of work and what is permissible work and what is not permissible work. Furthermore, I'd like to say that even though it's not explicitly said in here. I have lots of questions about what it means for um, for consumption of food, because I would argue back at this commentator, I make no differentiation the way I consume food on day one of Pesach and on the third day of Cholomoed Pesach. There's no differentiation in the way I use my kitchen, the way I consume food, what I permit myself to eat, don't permit myself to eat. There is, however, uh, there, there are uh, customs out there like Gebrochs that actually do make differentiations. Let me let me elucidate that in case there's anyone who isn't familiar with this idea, which is that there are those out there who are so strict that they would not permit even already baked matzah, that is matzah itself and matzah that's ground up, like matzah meal, matzah farfel, matzah flour, to touch any sort of moisture or liquid such that even that would then bake and resemble uh, something that's leavened. But on the last day of Pesach, they dafka, they precisely, they specifically and deliberately ensure that they eat that because they want to be clear that they're, that that is not explicitly prohibited. So they go about eating gabrachs, eating that moistened, it's a terrible way to describe it, um, the wedded um, uh, matzot on that last day. Right. Um, we're, we're saying we made a great uh, cards against meets Ryan, like a kids against humanity game at home. And we were saying that soggy matzah should be a clue next year. Right. Because like who wants soggy matzah? But apparently some people want the right to soggy matzah. Right. They want their matzah braai on the last day. So did you have something to add? Okay, so we're going to keep reading in this commentary because we're going to get a little further about into what this particular commentator has to say. Oh, Larry has something to say. It's only I have to say say from uh, my father is, and it wasn't for religious reasons at all, but is a practice which I'm going to do tonight when I go home is to take a board of matzah and to sprinkle it with water and put salt on it. Ah. Oh. Dafka, just to sprinkle it. Your father's practice was to sprinkle water and put and, uh, and put salt on, so it'd stick. Yeah. Not so much that it was soggy. Yeah. Put salt on it so it would stick to the matzah. It sounds perfect to me. No, no, I said no, no. No, in no religious reasons at all. I'm saying. You know, it's just, honor, it's just tasty, right. right? Tonight, in honor of your father, you'll have a little bit of salty matzah that requires a little sprinkle of water. Okay, I like it. It reminds me of how, like, uh, in my in my husband's household, I asked him to please pass the salt the first, uh, which is a whole other thing. They don't pass salt in their household. Um, they, I asked him to pass the salt for the uh, hard boiled eggs on their table the first seder, and he said, "No, we don't actually put salt on our seder table. We use the salt water for everything. So they use the salt water for their soup. They use the salt water for their eggs. They use the salt water for the matzah for everything." Yeah, which is a very similar idea. Like you want to use it for for the everything. Yeah, Marshall. Yeah. 
It's a disparage, yeah. Correct. Sure. I don't want to go too far. Without knowing what... I want to have like a limit as to what I'm allowed to and not allowed to. Right. So, okay. We need to both break down a little bit Mivazet, and also we need to break down uh, Holomoed, and then we'll go on with the commentary. So, very quickly, uh, you know, Bizui, the idea of Bizui or Mivazet, it's the same same idea and same root. It's it's uh, almost nearly making a waste of so it's it's so it's as disparaging or uh or putting down in stature um so i would say like we might even translate it as i guess uh lowering in stature or something along those lines but it is i think that's why disparaging is used and spurning is a nice way of, of putting it as well and then in terms of whole homo ed generally speaking the notion is that both for sukkot and also for pesach the idea is that there are days that are inclusive to uh, they're basically, they are the days that fall interim to two sets of Yom Tov. That's the understanding. That's the rabbinic understanding. So the days that fall interim to Yom Tov. And there are laws and have been for hundreds and hundreds of years, all of them rabbinic, which is the point of this commentator, all of them rabbinic, which apply to those interim days. So there are laws that only apply Chol HaMoed Sukkot, and there are laws that only apply Chol HaMoed Pesach. There, there are things that are regulations that of, as to what one may do on those days that are different than what one would do on Yom Tov. All right, so to continue in this commentary and to finish up um, our conversation, uh, we're going to go from uh, the idea of is not explicit in the Torah. And this is in the way of one who is a heretic for one thing, to anger, as we have explained, such that he has no share in the world to come. So hold on tight because this that gets a little philosophical. And now I'm going to break break down uh, that statement. And our rabbis, may their memory be blessed, said in Bechorot, that is the tractate in the Babylonian Talmud of Bechorot 30b, that one who comes to convert and says, behold, I accept all of the Torah except for one matter from the words of the sages, we do not accept him. And they, may their memory be blessed, said in Makot 23a, that's the uh, another tractate of Talmud, one who spurns the holidays is like one who worships idolatry. This is the uh, same statement, right? This is a quote of that same, same uh, statement of Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah quoting the Amoraim. This may actually be the Amoraim there. You shall observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Chag Matzot, and adjacent to it is this verse about you shall not make molten gods for yourselves. And they, may their memory be blessed, explain in Chagiga 18a, you shall observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread, observe to not do work all of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And we were warned with this about work on the intermediate days of the festival. And that which it is written in Vayikra in the 23rd chapter, verse 39, uh, a Shabbat Shabbaton, a complete rest on the first day and a complete rest on the eighth day is because there are many types of work that are permitted on the intermediate days of the festival, as is explained in their words, may they be blessed. So what's brought here by our commentator is this idea uh, uh, that just as the rabbis taught, the sages taught, that if somebody were to come and say, I'd like to convert to Judaism, and I'm cool with everything I've been taught, there's just this one thing, right? This one food or this one holiday or this one concept or this one prayer that I cannot take upon myself. They're holding that up by comparison to this idea, the one who, who does all of Pesach, Yom Tov, and completely celebrates it, does the Seder meals, does the festivals with whole heart and sings Hallel until the wee hours of the morning and completes all of the festival celebrations just as one would hope one would do, invites their guests, opens the door for Elijah, and then Chol HaMoed comes, and they're just right back to work as usual 
and go back to their regular stuff. They're making a comparison between those two teachings. I find that stretch a really big stretch. I'm not even sure that it's a particularly poetic or liturgically uh, or, or sort of um, literarily uh, great stretch to make in terms of a commentary. But what I find really interesting about it is to think about the reality that somebody would be living in that would draw them to make this kind of a chuva, this kind of a response paper. What exactly were people doing? Because I don't think that the, that the thing they were doing was going out for pancakes on day three that, that caused this response. That's not the issue. The response is going back to life as usual, which makes me think about how interesting it is that we so hyper focus on this idea as the verse is focused in. That's why I wanted us to go deeply into the verse. The verse says you should eat matzot for seven days and you should observe a chag. So explicitly in the Torah, we're supposed to eat matzahs and we're really hyper focused on the food. And you know what? I think centuries and centuries later, we've done a really good job of that. But what we haven't done in particular is made the rest of the holiday about much of anything other than food. Like if I asked you, what are you doing to celebrate the fourth day of Pesach? What are you doing to, for the second day of Cholmo at Pesach? What are you doing? Eating. eating more matzah, right? Like eating more matzah. Are you having, you know, another Seder? Are you doing something else? Are you celebrating freedom? What happens after those days? I actually think it's a brilliant point. I don't think the point here is to disparage people to use their you know, words. I don't think it's to be I don't think it's to say it's so terrible that you go back to work. I don't think that's the problem here to kind of graft a little bit of the, the language. I think that the question here is, what are you doing to differentiate this this Tuesday from any other Tuesday during the year besides eating the matzo? What is it that you're doing that's a, a positive observance of uh, of Pesach, other than refraining from what you would otherwise be doing. I would love to take uh, either comments or questions on this. I saw Larry's hand first, and then I'll come to you. Okay. Does that bring up the rest of it? No, it's very different in Sukkot, because Sukkot is eating in the Sukkah. 100% totally different in Sukkot, because you're eating in the Sukkah, and it is just, it is completely experientially different. And the second thing is, in the early days of Israel's founding, when Israel was much more secular than it is now, not just they established that on Cholam night, the work day would be shorter than it was during the rest of the year. So even if you choose to work, you only work six hours that day as opposed to eight or nine, whatever the case may be. Oh, I love that. The drawback is, if you take that day off, you're, or it's not a drawback. If you take that day off, you, you don't get a, you, you don't use a full work day off. You only use it for six hours and actually calculate that and give it back to you. That's so, so they interesting. Have made, they have made, and and to, it's true to this day. So to this day, Larry says, since the founding of the state of Israel, it's the case that that people actually have a shorter set work day and work hours, and the implications of that uh, are that one actually has a different work week during the work week, and therefore malacha is actually different during um, during one's work week uh, of of the intermediate days. Um, I saw your hand. Yeah. So you know. I, So it's not the full observance of not observance of not working, but you still but realizing that you can't do certain things. It's sort of a prohibition. Right. So to a certain extent, I agree with you. Like this idea is that that the prohibitions on what it is that we can't eat during the week, mm -hmm. um, and therefore, you know bringing that matzah sandwich to work, to school, uh, making sure that we don't, you know, stop for that usual frappuccino, whatever it was, right? And maybe just that black cup of coffee if you feel comfortable uh, doing so, even outside the house, we could talk about that. I think that's probably fine. Um, but I, I think that, um, I think that what this chuba would say is, it would probably ask each individual person, is, is that enough to differentiate? Because if it is enough for you, and if it really does feel not just 
onerous. I don't think the point is to be onerous, but if it really does feel different, different than other days, you know, you kind of put a different mat down on your desk and you pull out your sandwich and everyone's saying, oh, how's your Passover holiday going? And it's a little bit different for you, then perhaps it really is a different kind of a work week. And perhaps you go home a little early to cook things and that kind of, maybe it really is differentiated. But if it's not so differentiated, I think that this chuva is coming to say, what, what else could you be doing that might differentiate it a little bit more? And I, I do think that it's speaking to this idea. I, love, I don't think I knew about the shortened work week. I knew, I knew about the idea that like, it was not the week to go to the biblical zoo in Israel because good luck, there are 1,400,000 whatever people you know, crawling all over because the idea is you really do make that week different and go and do tiulim, go and do trips. Um, but I think making the making the week different is um, is something that we sometimes miss because it is such a week geared towards the prohibitions alone. But for some people, I agree with you; those prohibitions actually make for such a different week that might be enough. Uh, I saw Sandra's hand. Yeah. Great question. So clearly, we don't do this anymore. Clearly, we don't differentiate. How do we get from there to here? There are a lot of answers to that. In some communities, they actually still are to a certain extent there. I'm going to offer one, um, one particular example of something that we do that's a little bit different and differentiated in our household that has nothing to do with uh, food. And it is mentioned in the code. So it was preserved into the, kind of the 15th century codes. And it's kind of a it's kind of a silly example, but it's a fun example to give you um, a little bit of context. And then I'm going to give you an offering of something to think about to bring home either to yourself or to your family. So here's the example that has to do with how we got from there to here. It's a little bit an answer to that question. And then I'll close with a, an offering to all of you. The example is that we're told, I'm not sure if, the, if this is in Mishnah Torah, but I know for sure in Shulchan Aruch, we're told that one is supposed to refrain from doing laundry during the days of Cholam Oed. So in our family, well, <laughs> hang on. I, better that one should do laundry on Cholam Oed than, than on Yom Tov. So better that one should do laundry on Cholam Oed than on Yom Tov. So good for you if you're waiting till Cholam Oed, I'm saying. Praiseworthy. It's, it's wonderful. Um, but one is, is supposed to. And so there's this wonderful idea um, that, uh, uh, that one should then some of the hachana, some of the preparation for the holiday isn't just buying new clothing, but it's also uh, doing laundry with the thought that I'm freeing myself. I'm sort of anticipating so I can say thanks past Hillary for doing all that laundry um, other than watching maybe some undergarments during the week. Like I, I would definitely do my best so that during that week I'm freed up from a labor that I would otherwise be doing during the week. So there are labors that we can uh, that we can kind of preface our observance of. And perhaps you could think about how you could do that for yourself during Sukkot. There are certain things that you can do to kind of prep your your home for or pre-buy, pre-do in your home uh, in order to free yourself from that sort of a labor. That aside, since that, I was going to say that that ship has sailed, right? Like that was, that was pre-Pesach anyway. I was going to say, I want to actually encourage you to, uh, to not leave the Seder questions aside, you know, before you go and you pack up your Haggadot, because I'm guessing that most of you probably still have Haggadot somewhere that are like lying around your house, challenge yourself, like st stick it with a magnet to the fridge or take something tonight. Don't leave all of the amazing thoughtfulness of Seder at the Seder. Take it into the week. Don't leave all of the Pesachness of Pesach just at the Seders. I think that there's a wonderful thought there of bringing the holiday all through the days of Pesach. I want to wish for you that, you know, you, there are all sorts of ways that you can do this. If you're the kind of person who makes uh, brachot sometimes over food, do the blessing, do the after blessing thoughtfully and, um, and make those inclusions for Pesach and remind yourself that it's still Pesach. If you're the kind of person who doesn't do that so much, 
take some of the questions you never got to this year in the Haggadah and again, you know, paste them up on your refrigerator or text them to your kids who are going back to their, uh, wherever it is that they're living and have a text conversation, which is something you can't necessarily do if you have certain observances on Yom Tov. Text them and have a nice back and forth. What, like, what's your fifth question this year during the week? So that's my challenge to all of us. Um, before we go, I see Chase and Sandries, and I'm going to give you a last comment or question. Yeah, I know when you were talking about um, Sukkot, I was thinking about my bar mitzvah for us because it was on Sukkot, and I thought it was interesting because this year, Thursday or Friday reading that Mark did really amazing, Yoshiko again, um, was Parshani Moore, which is part of, um, you know, which was part of Sukkot. So I was thinking about as he was reading it, and I was kind of singing along. So it was just making me think, does it? Exactly. That, and, and, and it's connected in, and is that, that's because you had a Sukkot uh, Bar Mitzvah, right? Holmud Sukkot Bar Mitzvah. Yeah, I have mine on um, Sukkot um, day one of 2021. Exactly. And, um, and we find ourselves, uh, that's actually a great note to lead, to um, kind of end on, which is that as we go to count the Omer tonight, it's such a wonderful thing when we think about these texts to, to get ourselves in, um, thinking about the year as a web of these uh, Chagim, even though we don't do them as pilgrimage festivals anymore, already we're counting the Omer to get ourselves into Shavuot. And then from Shavuot, we're already thinking to the next festival, to Sukkot, uh, and into these intermediate days. So may we always be looking forward to the joy of the next festival, uh, anticipating it with joy, reading something and thinking about the next time that we can host and ask questions and do wonderful things together. And I hope that the joy of Pesach is with you all through Hol HaMoed. Um,